progress. Hi everyone, this is Kyla from Hidden Gems Literary Emporium uh, here in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Today is a very, very special day. We have Dr. Tracy Shores, who is here celebrating the release of her new book, Everyday Trauma. Um, remapping the brain's response to stress and anxiety and painful memories for a better life. Dr. Shores, I wanna thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for asking me to come. Um, thank you everyone who is joining us right now. Um, there's a lot of loved ones and friends and family here. Um, and some people who maybe have never heard of you. So let's begin by you just briefly introducing yourself and telling us why you decided to write this book. Um, yeah, so my name is Tracy Shores and I'm a neuroscientist uh -huh. at uh, Rutgers University. Um, I've been working on the brain for like 40 years now, but you know, who's counting? And I just finally decided it was time to write a book. I'd always wanted to write a book. Um, my mother was a big fan of books. She taught us to love books when I when we were young. We always went to the library because you could get like free books there. And um, it was just, you know, something that I always kind of wanted to do. Um, my mentor when I when I was a young scientist, he also wrote a lot of books. And so I kind of always was just amazed, you know, that he could he could write so many books, even when he was, you know, quite young. And then I also had other friends that wrote books. So anyway, I just like always had this desire to to write a book. And then um, I finally just decided to do it. You know, I got to a certain age and I was like, well, if I'm really going to do it, I just need to like buckle down and, and do it. I mean, it it takes so much longer than you think, you know, so it's taken me like three years to write this book from beginning to end. Right. Yeah. Um, three very important years, I will say, because this book is very, very well written. Um, why did you decide to choose this topic? Um, that even like took a while for me to decide what I would focus on. But most of my research, uh, particularly my laboratory studies have been on stress and trauma. And so, and you know, so I'll, obviously after all these years, I, I know quite a bit about it. So initially I was really going to work, focus more on like stress and trauma in women, because we know that women are very um, vulnerable to stress. And in fact, many more women than men are diagnosed with PTSD, anxiety disorders, depression. So my initial focus was, was kind of that angle. But once I started, I thought, maybe I'll open it up, you know, and make it a, a, a bigger story and have it just be about what is stress? What is trauma? And how does the brain process this kind of information and then change us? You know, how does it change us really forever or sometimes forever? And for the negative things that happen, the stress, the anxiety, the depression, you know, what can we do to, to uh, overcome some of the memories potentially, or at least uh, lessen their impact. But, you know, it's been a long, it's been a long journey. A long time coming. And finally yeah. we're here celebrating the release <laughs> of this book, Everyday Trauma is now available for everyone to purchase. Um, I want to talk about one of the things that you mentioned early on in the book, on the book, in the book, which is gender discrimination. Um, when we're talking about mental health and mental illness. Um, and I thought it was really cool, actually, that you included that as a speaking point. Um, what influenced you to talk about the differences uh, that you have learned about in the past 
at, in regards to gender and mental health and the things that you're studying now in that regard? Yeah, so one of the things that I, I wanted to do was, well, let me start by saying, when people think about trauma, they normally think about like one experience, right? They usually think of something like an earthquake or a violent attack or maybe a miscarriage or, you know, something that you could describe as like one event. And so when we think about trauma or post-traumatic stress disorder, a lot of times people think of those kind of experiences, but many experiences we have are not like that. They go on, you know, day after day, and we don't even necessarily know the impact until we've gone through them. And so being discriminated against is, you know, is an example. It happens all the time. It could happen maybe not every day, but like it could happen for a lot of the life of someone's lifetime. Or, you know, ageism is something um, that happens. You know, people start to become discriminated because they're older or um, a chronic illness. You know, there's just so many examples. And I, uh, and I'm just trying to get my, <laughs> I'm seeing so many different faces here. I'm sorry, I have to change this look here. Okay. Um, so those kind of traumas, the short ones, the ones that only, you know, happen maybe within a day or two, they're also everyday traumas to the extent that they stay in your mind, you know, every day or every week or every, who knows? you think about them and go over them. And so to some extent, there's still everyday traumas, even though the event itself is over. Um, so I was trying to distinguish between like that kind of everyday trauma and then these other everyday traumas that go on every day. Like, I think the pandemic is another great example. Well, it's not nothing great about the pandemic, <laughs> but it's an example of an everyday trauma because it's happening on and off like day after day and week after week and now it's what year after year and we don't really know when it's ever when and if it's ever going to really end and you know those kind of traumas those everyday traumas are the ones that really affect the brain because they just accumulate right in the book i talk about situations where people were really depressed you know for a long part a, a large part of their life and then there's changes there's anatomical changes in their brain as a consequence now you know does that mean that when you have a trauma that everything in your brain is changing or the anatomy is going to you know permanently be altered no of course not i mean because our brain is very resilient it can adapt to change but if the trauma is happening every day or you're thinking about it every day yeah, then there's going to be some long term changes in the brain, probably. Changes in the brain and also different consequences, such as, you know, you talk about anxiety, which is um, which has become a word that's frequently used um, even in media and songs and things like that. Um, but you talk about something very interesting, which is good anxiety versus bad anxiety. Can you explain what that is and how we as people can identify which is which? Yeah, I mean, anxiety means a fear of the future. So anxiety is about the future. And it's usually based on something that happened in the past. So if something bad happened to you in the past, you develop some anxiety about what could happen in the future. And, you know, that's based on a memory because you had to make a memory of what happened so that you could then try to prevent something bad from happening again. So the good anxiety is those kind of positive responses that you make. So say, you know, I talk in the book about this time when somebody, you know, tried to break into my house while I was sleeping, you know, after that experience, luckily, you know, I survived. I had a lot of anxiety about being alone, about just all kinds of things that arose, but that was kind of useful. Like it made me much more aware of my surroundings. I 
you know, always either had a dog or a security system or something. So I became much more aware. But, you know, if that anxiety had become uh, interfered with my life to where I wouldn't want to go outside of my house or I wouldn't want to meet new people or, uh, you know, all the kind of negative consequences, then that's not, not good anxiety. So I, I think sometimes people feel like some of these responses like stress and anxiety, even depression, that they're somehow, we want to get rid of them, that they're bad and we just don't want them. But the reason we have them is because they're useful, right? We need, we need a little bit of all of them so that we can learn and try to make things better in the future. Yeah. So it's yeah. just when they get, you know, they get kind of get carried away. And, and, and one of the things that can happen too is like when you've, when they become like a habit, like one of the things I talk a lot about in the book is ruminations. So ruminations are thoughts that we have the same thought over and over again. They're repetitive. They're usually negative. They're they're often about our well. They are about ourselves, and they're usually like full of blame and regret. Like I wish that hadn't happened. If I hadn't done this, this wouldn't have happened. Those kind of thoughts, you know, are really detrimental to our mental health because we're sitting here <clears throat> thinking about what could have been, and we're missing what you know what's happening now. So. It's just you know, one of the reasons I wrote the book is I just kind of felt like people could, if they learned a little bit more about how the brain processes our experiences of our lives, then they wouldn't be so attached to them to some extent. Uh, and, you know, re reading the book, it kind of helped me in that way to know the biological and physical ways that my thoughts affect my body, it kind of makes you more, con more conscious of the thoughts that you have. Uh, or when you do start to ruminate, you can catch yourself and say, wait, let me not just dwell on this thought. Let me change my train of thought because this is going to affect not only my day and my state of mind, but it's literally going to affect the way that my brain develops. And I think that's just fascinating. Yeah, exactly. I'm glad you said that because I mean, even for me, I, I know that the brain is what generates thoughts and feelings and emotions and memories, but it's very hard to accept that it's happening here in this piece of tissue that's in in our skull because our thoughts seem so amazing right they seem so otherworldly and almost like super super sensory but they're just thoughts you know they're just thoughts generated by a piece of tissue in your head and that's that's kind of nice to know because we can let some of them go if we if we know that right that goes back to the old saying, knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. And we have more power than we, th than we think. And um, I love how on page 79, you include a quote from Mildred Norman, also known as Peace Pilgrim. Some of you in here watching may have heard of this woman, but she spent, I'll just read from the book. She spent her early adult years as a secretary and sometimes flapper near Atlantic City, New Jersey. She's New Jerseyan. <laughs> she um, and then in her 40s, she walked the entire length of the Appalachian Trail and soon thereafter gave up all her possessions, crisscrossing the United States seven times on foot. She nearly she walked for nearly 30 years, logging over 25,000 miles before she quit counting. She obviously had a lot of time to think, all of which culminated into this quote, which I love, and thank you for including this. If you realized how powerful your thoughts are, you would never think a negative thought. I love that. And when we were on the phone earlier, we were talking about how positive thoughts, and correct me if I'm wrong, but positive thoughts create positive consequences in the body, in the brain. Negative thoughts create negative consequences in the body, in the brain. Would you say that's true? 
Generally, yeah, I would say that's true. That's pretty much how it works. You know, you have a, a thought and then the thought is often connected to a memory. And then that memory is associated with, with feelings that are generated by the body. You know, so one of the things that I, I did try to do also in the book is kind of distinguish between thoughts, uh, memories, and feelings. Because I think also sometimes people feel like they're, they're all happening at the same time or that they're indistinguishable from one another. But, but and they do overlap, obviously, but, but they are different. And it takes time. It takes time to go from a thought to a memory to a feeling right and then back to whatever back to a thought and then over back to a new memory and now you what now you've made another memory and so once you kind of realize that this is a system of things going you know all over your body then you can kind of stop and and slow down a little bit and see how it's traveling now whether or not you can never have a, ne a negative thought i don't know if that's even possible but Maybe for, for Peace Pilgrim <laughs> it was, but most people ha are going to have negative thoughts. But you can, like I said earlier, you can become like just a little more aware of them and, and how they're affecting you, affecting you emotionally. I want to ask you a question about that, about this cycle between thought, memory, and feeling. Um, okay, so let's say I am ruminating about something negative. So it would start as a thought, right? Okay, that thought would trigger a memory in my mind. Possibly, um, or it probably would, yeah. Um, and so is there a way that we can stop this cycle between memory and feeling? Um, yeah, I think to some extent you can. Um, I was, I mentioned in, in the book this time that I, um, I was going to cook something and for my relatives out there, you know, I'm not a big cooker. <laughs> and so I was making dinner for my son and, um, he didn't want to eat and I could feel myself like kind of getting a little, little mad. Like, what do you mean? You're not going to eat. I cook this meal. I hardly ever cook, you know, and I could feel myself getting mad because of the thought and the memory of me, you know, not normally cooking, but now I was cooking. And so I went upstairs and I just like sat with my thoughts. You know, I just sat and I was like, why are you getting so angry about this? And it turned out he was sick. Like when I went back downstairs and then later he ended up, he was sick. And so, you know, I, I was so happy that I didn't say anything like super angry to him. So it's a, you know, you can, and, but you know, many times you can't, it just, it goes from thought to memory to feeling. And before you know it, you said something that you really, you know, regret or. So I think That's it's helpful. It's helpful to just slow down a little bit. Sometimes you just have to like, listen to your own thoughts. I mean, it's taken me a really long time to, to learn that, but sometimes I just have to listen to my own thoughts. That's why you hear people say, just take a breather, just take five deep yeah. breaths in and out. But it really does make, I mean, it may sound cliche, but it really does make a big difference in how you react or don't react actually to situations. If you just take a moment, take some deep breaths. And in the book, you talk about the flow of oxygen and um, breathing and the flow of blood and things like that. And uh, it really does affect the way that you think and feel about situations, which I guess in turn could affect the memory that is made based off of your decision of that event. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, one of the things I, I talk a lot about too in the book is when and I'm not sure people necessarily know this, but so you have a memory, so you've encoded this information of something that happened in your life somewhere in your brain. We don't exactly know how that works, but we have some idea. And so then you retrieve this memory, you bring it back into this moment. So say I think about, I don't know, my uncle Jay, 
I had this uncle Jay that I loved. He wore, he drove this little red sports car and he was just cool. So, okay, so say I, I bring up this memory of my, of my uncle Jay. Now I've made another memory of him because I brought him up into this moment, right? So now he's associated with this moment where I was, you know, talking about my book and I ended up talking about my uncle Jay. And, you know, so now I have another memory in my brain of him in this moment. Now, that happens to be a fond memory, but you can imagine if you have a negative memory and you just keep kind of going over it and then go back over it again, you know, you might be making some more memories of that. And I like the analogy that you made in the book of a memory being like a document. And so when you bring it to the forefront, and you create a new memory of that memory, as you just explained, it's kind of like editing the same document. And so now you're saving different versions of the same document on your hard drive, which is your brain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, that was a really great illustration that helped me understand, uh, you know, that concept. And, um, Another a general thing that I like about the book is that it's, of course, there's science in there, but it's not overly scientific for people who are reading who um, don't have knowledge on, you know, who aren't neuroscientists or, you know, who haven't studied biology or science. You make it really clear and easy for people to understand. And I think it's, again, I think it's really helpful to have an understanding of the way that your body works and how it can affect your health which can ultimately affect your longevity and it's just an interesting concept to think about how your thought process can affect your longevity in your life um it's just it's it's really it's really helpful as a reader thank you yeah, I mean, one of the things I say is like people spend so much time, you know, worried about their biceps or their hair or whatever, but like their brain is like, oh, I'll worry about my brain later. What? Like it's your brain. <laughs> it's like the most important right. organ of your body. And you're like, oh, yeah. this, you know, if something bad happens, maybe I'll exercise or go to therapy or no, we have to like keep it, keep it going, like keep it healthy. And there's right. ways to do that. Right. They're not necessarily, you know, easy, but there are ways to keep your brain healthy. Yeah. And let's talk about some of those ways. Okay. Um, and I was just, before we started the event, I was telling you that I really like the analogy of, um, what's the show again? American Ninja Warrior. <laughs> yeah. Um, tell everyone why you talked about America Ninja Warrior in the book. <laughs> Yeah, so I don't know if everyone has seen this. I used to watch it with my son, Evan, American Ninja Warriors. So um, it's these people who are, I, I think they're just like normal kind of everyday, but definitely exuberant uh, people who are generally athletic, I guess you could say to some extent. But anyway, they go on this um, It's kind of like a... I don't even know how to explain it. It has all these different tasks that you have to do. Like there's a rolling wheel that you have to like stand on it and try to stay on it. And then you jump onto another wheel or else you end up in some water. And I don't know, it just, there's just all these kind of really challenging physical tasks. And the reason I, I kind of like it as an example, cause it's a really good example of mental training and physical training together. Cause you're, you're, you have to pay attention. It moves really fast and you have to be prepared for something completely bizarre that you now have to do while you're exercising. You know, it's generally pretty aerobic, so it requires some like energy and your heart is going to be racing. And so it's, yeah, it's a really good example of, of the combination of mental and physical training. And then, you know, one of the things that, that we did in my lab, you know, years ago now is kind of studied that and showed that that has like particularly good effects on the brain because it's bringing um, a lot of oxygen to the brain. We need lots of oxygen. 
to make new cells and new connections and new even new neurons and new blood vessels and then you combine that with learning while you're learning something so yeah it's a, i think it's just a really good example of of what you can do to really enhance the, the structure and the function of your brain now i mean most people can't aren't ninja warriors <laughs> so you have to be realistic and think about things that that you could do or you would do that would help you. Yeah, and that's a great segue into map training. So why don't you tell us about that, um, how you got that started and how we can all get involved in that program. Okay. So I guess it was like 10 or 15 years ago now, I started thinking about taking what I've learned being in the laboratory for, for so many years and studying the brain and develop something positive for people. You know, it's one thing to go out in the world and talk about the brain and that's fine. But, you know, I also really wanted to provide something useful that people could use in their everyday lives that would help them keep their brain healthy. And so based on some of the research I did, um, I decided to devise this program. It's called MAP training and MAP stands for mental and physical. So it's kind of like the Ninja Warrior story, but um, it's actually a little more structured than that. So the first part of the program is meditation. So it's 30 minutes of silent meditation followed by 30 minutes of aerobic exercise. And so the idea is like, while you're meditating in silence, you're learning, right? You're learning more about your own brain, your own thoughts. I mean, a lot of times when people think of meditation, they think it's about relaxing or not thinking, or at least the type that, that we do in this program is, is not like that. It's, it's hard. It's hard to sit completely in silence. Um, and listen to your own thoughts and try to focus on one thing at a time. So in this program, we, I have people focus on their on their breath, counting their breath for like 20 minutes, which 20 minutes, you know, that doesn't seem that long. But when you're sitting in complete silence, trying to focus on your breath, it seems like a really long time. And then we do 10 minutes of really slow walking, kind of the same concept, but now just focusing on on your feet. And then we quickly transition into aerobic exercise. So the aerobic exercise, aerobic means oxygen. So in order to have, to get more oxygen to your brain, you need to, to get your heart rate up. So you get your heart rate up about like 60% of your max. Most people that would be like 100 beats per minute. And you could do it any way you want. You could do it dancing, spinning, swimming, running, you know, whatever it takes to get your heart rate up. And that combination is, you know, we've shown is like super good for people's mental health, their physical health, how they feel about themselves, their self esteem, changes the brain, obviously, uh, helps with cognition. And anyone pretty much can do it. That's the other beauty of it is it's it's not, it doesn't cost any money, you know, it doesn't require uh, fancy equipment or experts, anyone can do it and, it and it will help, it will help you. And it's pretty much about making a commitment to um, change the way you think, the way you move your body making a commitment to, and it actually has to be a part of your lifestyle. And in the book, you talk about, you know, saying, okay, I'm going to exercise once a week versus saying, okay, I'm going to do this type of exercise every day, whether it's for an hour or 15 minutes, or I'm going to do this new type of learning every day um, for a little bit or, you know, however much time you can, but it's, one thing that I've gathered from the book is that it can sometimes be small changes that make a really big impact 
um, and how you move about in your daily life uh, and how you live and grow, you know, years and years to come in the future. And maybe even the effect that it can have on your children and your family and the people around you. Exactly. I mean, some of the studies that we did, people only did it once a week for six weeks. And we found significant differences in how stressed out they felt. They were much less depressed, much less anxious. Um, in fact, I did a study recently during the pandemic um, in the summer of 2020. So right, the first summer of the pandemic. And we did it in, with teachers because we knew that teachers were really stressed out about going back into the classroom and or teaching online. And so we recruited like 50 teachers and they did it once a week online. And the teachers who did the program were less stressed, they were sleeping better, they were less anxious. And then the teachers who didn't do it, they actually got more anxious and more stressed as the as the as the summer went on so what was you know i think interesting about that data is it shows that it isn't just about the past it also helps you with the future right it'll kind of prevent some of these feelings from arising uh in the future once a week so that's what i mean like anyone can do it it's once a week it's not like you have to you know, move to a mountain top or <laughs> become a monk or something or become or a ninja warrior. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You can do it in your own house once a week. You're good to go. Right. Um, I want to thank you for putting this together. Um, I think I want to encourage everyone who can hear the sound of my voice to get a copy of this book, Everyday Trauma. And uh, read it with an open mind and an open heart and think about ways that you can make these small changes um, that has been proven to make a huge effect on your life. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people, majority of people today are living in extremely stressful environments, um, state of minds, uh, I mean, in the last, especially since the pandemic, I can, we can all kind of feel that the stress level and the anxiety levels are rising in our environments. And so this is a nice breath of fresh air, um, you know, that there's hope for us, that we can, you know, uh, think more positively, live healthier lives and when we think about health, we usually think about the body first, but this book shows us that it's really actually about the brain first and the way that we think. Um, so thank you for even just starting this conversation through this book about that. Um, where can we buy the book? I mean, I have one, but where can we buy the book? Well, we can buy it at Hidden Gems, which yes, is absolutely. Kyla's new bookstore in downtown New Brunswick, which I'm also like so excited to hear that there's a new bookstore in New Brunswick. Thank you. We're happy to be here. Yeah, it's so good. I'm just I love bookstores and I yeah, I'm just so happy to have a new one on the Rutgers uh, in the Rutgers campus. That's right in town. So definitely uh, you can buy it there. You can also get it on Amazon.com and Barnes and Noble and um, so if you just, you know, Google it, it'll, it'll definitely come up. We just started selling today. So, but you can buy it anywhere, I think. All right. That's exciting to know. And so everybody, um, well, first, of course, I have to say, come by Hidden Gems Literary Emporium and get your copy. We're at 55B Morris Street in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Um, if you give us a call at 609, well, I'll put it in the chat. If you give us a call, we can also uh, send you a copy to your home. Um, and Dr. Shores, we look forward to having you hopefully sometime next year. Um, yeah. My husband and I also went to Rutgers University, New Brunswick. So we are Rutgers fam and we would love to invite, you know, the Rutgers fam and, you know, of course, your personal family and friends and colleagues to come celebrate you 
um, take some pictures and things like that. So thank you to um, Flatter on Books who helps you with this uh, beautiful work of literary art. And um, any closing remarks before we end, Dr. Shores? Well, mostly I just am so happy to see my friends and relatives here on this special night. I learned today it's a birth, it's a book birthday. So this is like my first book birthday. <laughs> so I'm just so happy you guys are all here on, on my birthday, my first book birthday. <laughs> and um, yeah, and just thank you for all your support. My beautiful son, Evan, is here. I'm happy he showed up. You know, he's, a, he's all over the book, as you know, Kyla. <laughs> and um, yeah, just thank you all for being here. It means a lot to me. And really quick, let's say someone's reading the book. Oh, people are saying great message, Tracy. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, let's say someone has a question about the book or they want to contact you and maybe leave a comment. Uh, where can they reach you? Um, you can reach me at either at shores at ruckers.edu. Um, I also have a Gmail account. It's maptrainmybrain at gmail.com. And also, if you want more information about um, the book or about map training, you can go to my website, which is also called maptrainmybrain.com. Okay. So basically, if you just Google map train my brain, all these things will likely come up and you can, I'm actually gonna do a, an online course starting in February. So if anybody wants to join in, please do so. That's exciting. Yeah. And so would we sign up for that on the website? Yes, you can sign up on my, on, at maptrainmybrain.com once a week. Oh, and there'll be a video though too. So you could do it once a week live with me and then, and or use a video. That sounds great. I just want to share. Um, Tamala. Tamala says, congrats, Tracy. Kremald <laughs> Bowman says, great message, Tracy. Jade Reese says, happy book birthday. Taryn says, congratulations. Looking forward to reading it. Um, thank you, Nakia, for putting the link to the website, Map Train My Brain. Uh, Peg Wright says, fantastic book. Map training is a wonderful process with the heart. Susan Shore says, congratulations, cuz. <laughs> Peg Wright again says that map training works. So she is a uh, believer in map training. Thank you, Peg, for your comment. Uh, <laughs> thank you, everyone who has joined us today to celebrate the release of Everyday Drama. Um, and I always have to look at the sub title because it's kind of long read mapping brain's response to stress anxiety and painful memories for a better life is that a hard cover yeah i'll have to There's say like, hard covers this oh, is the hard cover i didn't know mine's a, well mine is a advanced <laughs> reader so mine's a soft cover but it's so pretty i know it is very pretty it really is so pretty i did not know it came in hardcover look at that how cute is that? <laughs> um, thank you, everyone, again, for joining us. Make sure you get your copy of Everyday Trauma. And thank you, Dr. Shores, for being here with Hidden Gems. Thank and you. We'll be seeing you all again very soon. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming, everyone. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Love you all.